You ask a dog to lie down and the dog instantly lies down. Your dog watches you prepare a meal and starts salivating. Operant and classical conditioning. Can you tell the difference? Knowing how to apply these concepts to your dog training can help you become a more effective trainer. And that's exactly what we're here to do. Hi, I'm Laura from DoggyU, and today I'm so excited to be collaborating with Jose from the Train Me Please YouTube channel to dive more in depth about classical and operant conditioning. Jose has a really amazing channel, so you should definitely check it out after this video. All right, without further ado, take it away, Jose. Hey, Jose here, and I run a YouTube channel called Train Me Please, where I share my passion for all things behavior modification and dog training. Today, we talk about these two incredibly useful and helpful concepts, operant and classical conditioning. Let me start by saying that distinguishing between them is something we do mostly to make them easier to understand. In reality, they often go together, but more on that later. When we are talking about operant conditioning, we are referring to using consequences to shape behavior. The theory of operant conditioning was proposed by American psychologist B.F. Skinner. In a nutshell, if a certain behavior is followed by a pleasant consequence, that behavior is likely to be maintained or to increase in the future. If a behavior is followed by an unpleasant consequence, that behavior is unlikely to be maintained and will probably happen less in the future. If a dog gets a cookie or praise after sitting and the next time we ask them to sit, they promptly sit, we can say that the sitting behavior has been reinforced. If a dog that jumps up to greet us gets scolded and the next time they greet us they do not jump, we can say that the jumping behavior has been punished. There is a problem with punishing behavior that way though, and it has to do with classical conditioning. So let's talk about that one now, shall we? We know about it because of Ivan Pavlov's groundbreaking work. We understand how stimuli can evoke reflexive responses. Think about your dog's excitement when they hear the leash jingle, anticipating an adventurous walk. Or the excited anticipation you feel just before reuniting with someone you love to hang out with. Classical conditioning is all about anticipation. So, what sets operant and classical conditioning apart? Well, for starters, it's about the nature of the behavioral response. Operant involves voluntary actions like sitting or staying or lying down. And for those, we can usually use the ABC model. Every behavior will have an antecedent, a behavior, and a consequence. You cue the dog to sit, they sit, and they get a cookie. This way of analyzing behavior can be used for literally every voluntary behavior. Classical deals with involuntary responses triggered by associations. In Pavlov's classical experiment, the dogs learn to associate that the neutral sound of a bell reliably predicted the appearance of something they enjoy, the food. This made them change how they felt and responded to the bell. After successive pairings of bell and food, they started to react to the bell as if it was the food itself. We can probably conclude here that they also developed a positive emotional response to the sound of the bell. The same principle is at play when we use a clicker or a marker word to train our dogs. This is uh, assuming that we always pair those with pleasant things such as food or play, for example. Classical conditioning intertwines with operant conditioning because we kind of are always in a way molding emotional states. When we are teaching a dog a new task, we lean a bit more on operant conditioning. But do not ignore the fact that classical always comes along for the ride. If we teach them with kind methods and positive reinforcement procedures, they will likely develop positive emotional responses towards those behaviors and us. If, on the other hand, we are teaching them with lots of unpleasant consequences, they are likely to develop fear and anxiety or other negative emotional responses. Another practical dog training application of classical conditioning is to use it to change how a dog feels in a given situation. For example, if a dog is afraid of the proximity of a certain object, we can pair the presence of that object 
with things that the dog finds enjoyable, such as food and toys, with repetition that can change how the dog feels about that object, especially if we do it slowly and keep the object at a certain distance initially. Hey y'all, I'm just breaking in here to ask you to head on down and boop that like button. Doing so lets Jose and I know that you're enjoying this video and want to see more. All right, back to you, Jose. Before we conclude the video, there's one more thing I'd like to mention about operant conditioning. Reinforcement and punishment can be positive or negative, depending on whether a stimulus is added or removed from the situation. Distinguishing between all of those options can be a bit tricky sometimes, so there will be some additional resources to understand this better in the description under the video. In the practical world of dog training, operant conditioning is our main tool for shaping behaviors, while classical conditioning helps address emotional states. Understanding and combining both can create a holistic approach to our relationships with dogs and contribute to a well-rounded training experience. And that's it for me. Thanks for having me, Laura. So a big thank you to Jose for coming on the channel. All right, everyone, if you liked that video, the algorithm says that you're gonna love this video too. So you should click on it now. You all have an awesome day and happy training.